Ladies and gentlemen, we are joined today by none other than Jeff Dice, president of the Mises Institute. He serves there as a writer, public speaker, and an advocate for property, markets, and civil society. He has been a uh, worked previously as a longtime advisor and check the box, Rod Paul's chief of staff for whom he wrote hundreds of articles and speeches. And in his years with Dr. Paul, he worked with countless grassroots activists and organizations dedicated to reducing the size and scope of government. Having been familiar with his work for many years, having seen him speak, albeit remotely, which seems like the normal thing now, at a conference in Malta a few years ago, I'm very excited to bring him on the show today as a, a, a true libertarian intellectual heavyweight. I'd like to think I'm capable of stepping in the same ring, but clearly my weight and pedigree does not match up. And now the reason I'm excited to be talking to Jeff today is about the Chaz. And I think this is going to get into a bigger conversation about homesteading and property rights as libertarian nerds like us tend to sidebar. And no, there's a deeper issue here. But uh, about the issue of Chaz, it seems as though we're both analyzing this from the same framework. Jeff and I are more or less uh, of identical ideological, ethical orientation framework. And uh, we have come down, it seems, on different sides of this issue, although barely. And that Jeff being barely against Chaz, but recognizes the positive things, where I'm barely for it, seeing the, the positivity in the, in the sovereignty declaration, while saying there are lots of things, obviously, to be against with it. And we didn't get to our news stories yet today about Chaz. Maybe if, if Jeff wants to talk about it, we can get into the police response, the shooting that happened there this past weekend. I'm sure these will all come up. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. Before we get into the heart of today's topic, is, is there anything you want our audience to know about you uh, by way of background about yourself or, or relevant background to this issue? No, I thought that was quite an introduction. I'm going to have to challenge the intellectual heavyweight part because I'm uh, I'm not an originator. I'm a secondhand dealer in ideas and happy to be so. But um, well, you know, yeah, Chaz is punching. You know, the punches. Well, well, I'll tell you what, Chaz is really fascinating. I mean, in a sense, we want to explore alternative political arrangements. I don't think there's anything more important than that in American society right now. Because what yes. we've got is clearly not working. That you know. That said, there's a couple ways to look at this. Are they colonizers in effect? And we've got so many layers to the onion because we have, you know, years and years, decades, centuries of somewhat untoward, unholy property arrangements, and it's awfully hard to undo all that. And then you have the mm -hmm. fact that people have, nonetheless oftentimes in good faith, relied on those years and decades and century when it comes to arranging their lives. Like if you happen to live in an apartment block building within Chaz that is surrounded on all four sides by su supposedly public or government streets, and you know the arrangement is that you can egress and, and ingress your apartment through those government streets, that's a hell of a thing to come along and take away from someone willy-nilly. Okay, so I, I'm 100% with you here, and, and, and maybe you can take, uh, take a minute to explain libertarian property rights concepts and, and how they would apply here. Well, I guess, you know, philosophically, it's pretty simple. We would say that private property is, is you know, very important, if not sacrosanct, in a, in a society that's going to be sensible and reliable and peaceful. And we would say that supposed public property, which is really just a, a term for government owned and controlled property, is illegitimate because government itself is illegitimate and it can't own anything. Uh, so, so from a pure philosophical or ideological perspective, when someone comes in, whether it's Chaz protesters or somebody else, and attempts to basically take over, occupy physically uh, what's termed government or public land, that's okay, as long as they're not impinging on the, the private property next door. And the reason it's okay is because government's not a legitimate owner. Right. All right, and that's, that's pretty simple in theory. Uh, that's what Walter Block would say. 
but it, it's not so simple in practice because there's a, a, a lot of impact on people's lives around here. So I think there's a difference, a fundamental difference between saying government can't legitimately own property and saying government can't de facto own, which means control property. So to understand what, what's going on, you know, control is really the essence of property ownership. Control means you can physically use it, you can sell it, you can borrow against it, you can uh, parcel it, you can do all kinds of things. You can build a hundred foot radio tower. That's what true ownership means. So, you know, you and I, are, as Americans, as taxpayers, we're said to, you know, well, we own public land. We all own public land together democratically. So, uh, but but you and I, we know we don't because we can't take our little sliver of Yellowstone National Park and go camp on it without permission, or we can't sell it off or sure. borrow against it or or do anything else. So, so when we say government owns land, what we really mean is they control it. So the, right. the, the, the specific individuals, whether those are bureaucrats or administrators or police or park rangers or whatever, city workers, I mean, they're the real owners at, that, at, at any point in time. The policy. Yeah, okay, so, so so we have a we have a hard we have a difficult task in understanding who ought to now control Chaz. And you gotta hand it to these people who have they they're the de facto owners at the moment. Yes. Now one of the things I loved about your article, uh the, the homesteaders or illegal squatters one, is that you you raise two other libertarian intellectual heavyweights into the argument, both uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe and my friend Walter Bl I, I consider them both friends. I actually got to meet Hoppe at the, uh, the, the conference in Malta, where, uh, where, where I, I first heard you uh, speaking live, at least, uh, if not in person. We can say live and not in person a lot now. Uh, yeah. But you, you, when you talked about the, the hot, so I, you, you allowed me to say the nerdiest libertarian thing I've ever said, which is my argument therefore meets both the Hoppian and Blockian criteria laid out by Jeff Dice. And, and in that, you know, what, what you said with the, the Hoppian criteria is, or, or what I turned into the Hoppian criteria from your point is that you say uh, the streets of Seattle are not virgin territory available to homesteaders, but rather akin to land held in trust admit by admittedly unworthy state agents on behalf of taxpayers. And it, it's not just that they are unworthy, it's that it's really uh, against our will as taxpayers, right? It's by coercion. And so what, now one of the case that I, the case that I would make, and now we're, we're, we're first addressing the claiming of government property part, which you, you seem to be generally uh, supporting that part of Chaz, as legitimate, separate from the challenge of, you know, you're an apartment that's surrounded by Chaz now. So if you're saying that, like, that by the Hoppian standard, these streets are, are owned by the taxpayers but held in trust, is it is it not righteous then for a group of taxpayers to get together and say, you know, we're out of here and, and we're going to take our shit. We're not going to take more. We're not going to take like all of the government streets where you know we, but you know, there's a few of us here. We're going to take our little share of, of government land, you know. And if it was you know in the woods and it was part of a national forest, say, look, you know what, guys, we're going to squat. We're going to claim this national forest land. You don't have a legitimate claim to it. It's ten acres. We're ten people. You know, we're we're definitely taking less than our share. It, would that be righteous in in taking that? And in that sense, is it righteous for Chaz to take just the, the government part of, of what they've taken control over? I think it's righteous in a sense, but the, the, the thing is, is that this Chaz experiment shows what we're up against in terms of breakaway or secessionary movements or any sort of decentralized movement. It, it's, you know, we can tell it's going to work a lot better if you actually have some new territory, like a, like a private city or <laughs> seasteading or something like that, because the, the problem is, look, you, you and I, we have the right to, as, to have you know fair commentary on what's going on in Seattle. But I don't think we have the right to tell them what to do. When you say uh, people people in, in uh, you know, you and I disagree with government owning property in, in uh, the Capitol Hill area of Seattle, 
Okay, that's true. But I'd be willing to bet 80, 90, 95% of the actual residents and inhabitants of Capitol Hill, even before this takeover, more or less agree with the idea of government owning the streets yeah. and everything. So it's like, it's not my place. It's not my place to tell them. I mean, at, at some point, I think we have to say that. It's not, uh, it's not my place to impose some libertarian worldview on people who don't want it. Um, right. So, so any kind of breakaway movement, even in Catalonia, in Spain, for example, that region of Spain, which, which by the way, is no joke because that contains Barcelona. We're talking about an act, a, a serious European capital, potentially breaking away from a central state. That's a big deal. Okay. Yeah. So in in their last vote, which is I I want to say 2014 or 2015, they got something like 80 percent voting for. Uh, the breakaway movement. Now, that might be skewed because people who are high on it vote in greater numbers or whatever. But let's just say 70% of Catalonians, Catalunes agree with it. And let's say 70% of Capitol Hill uh, neighborhood folks agree with Chaz. That still leaves a very thorny question of that remaining 30%. Um, right. And, and are they, so, are yeah, they yeah. made worse off? Yeah, no, I think we're both in a, a absolute agreement here that this is not the best way to do what they're doing or how we would like to see secession and decentralization happen as libertarians. Although I do I do want to, you know, I dispute one thing here because you said, you know, to, to start with new land like seasteading or uh, you, you made some other examples there. But like I'm, for example, I'm I'm working on creating our own sovereign space here at uh, at the Garden of Freedom in my 10 acre homestead, and I'm starting it in within the existing country. But obviously, there are advantages to saying I'm not reclaiming some public property that I have some share to as a taxpayer, some claim, and I, I'm doing it with complete private property where. You know, it's it's no one's disputing my individual ownership of this land. And that leads to, uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, advantages, I, I should say. But then this this bigger problem of deciding to break off, as, as you point out, with the uh, the minority who disagrees now being forced into something that they disagree with. And see, this even the creation of the problem solves the problem itself here, as I see it. And, and you could apply this to the United States Revolution. I want to challenge you on this, too. Like, how does if you're saying that you're opposing Chaz because it doesn't meet these property rights standards, you know, in, in, in the core action of, of sovereignty itself, you know, would you say that you oppose the American Revolution? Because you know, only a third were of the colonists, uh, you know, by the, the mainstream, I don't know if this is accurate, historical analysis, is that, you know, a third of the colonists were for it, a third were against, a third were neutral, and really only 3%, you know, the three percenters made it happen. So if you have the Chaz breaking off and saying, we're this, and yeah, we're, we're including this private property that we acknowledge as private within our new sovereign unit, don't they then have to recognize the right of that property owner to break off and to go back to Seattle. And, and it seems like if you if you just assert this core right, this core human right of autonomy and self-determination and the right to be wrong and the right to be dumb socialists and ineffective communists and all of the other problems that we're seeing with these left wing ideologies, you know, isn't it isn't it still critical? That, that we support the, the individual act that's positive itself and say, yes, it's problematic. Yes, it raises these issues. But overall, the problem contains the solution, more sovereignty, more autonomy, more freedom. And uh, I don't know, do you, I'm sorry, there's a lot of questions. So please, if you want to respond to any of that, go ahead. I agree. I, I mean, I think that the property has to be claimed in a matter uh, compatible with homesteading principles. So, you know, you mentioned your own piece of property and 
uh, as opposed to, you know, virgin or new land. You know, I, I think that's a good start because at present there's no dispute to your property claim. Now, maybe some uh, Native American has a distant claim or something like that. I, I get that. But it, it, at the moment, you have what, what appears to be a good free title. So that's good. You know, if some rich guy buys an island or something, that's good. Uh, if some people voluntarily sort of build out a private city that looks like Singapore or something, but on on the edge of of some existing country, that's good because there's you know the claim seems more valid. Where when you just throw it, throw something into the middle of an existing city like Seattle, you know who ought to control it and who ought to have the right to now assert jurisdiction is is a lot tougher because people haven't all voluntarily come there and done that. So. You, look, you're right. It's always going to be imperfect. I mean, is the American Revolution, was it philosophically justified even with one third, one third, one third? I, I guess. I mean, the, now you and I may not like the outcome. We might say in hindsight, it didn't work out. But that's different than saying it was unjustified, even if it was, it was happening back then. So, um, you know, the reason I don't like Chaz isn't philosophical or ideological. I just think the people... Uh, do behind it are violent people who don't respect property and who are likely to make uh, everyone there, including themselves, worse off as a result of this. And I happen to like Seattle. I think it's a beautiful city. I've, I've visited an, enough times to sort of wish that it wasn't being trashed. Um, <laughs> but Likewise. look, um, you know, it's, it's you got to you got to th things are messy. Uh, th this is how new arrangements start. And let's, yeah, I'm old enough to remember the 80s, and nobody thought the Soviet Union was going to fall. And nobody thought Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Ukraine would develop independent identities. That would, you would, if you said that in 1982, people would have thought you were crazy. They would have thought there was no way the Soviets are going to let that happen without raining down nukes on somebody. And it did. So, you know, nobody thought Donald Trump was going to get elected president. Um, so the, the problem in America is, is, first of all, we've got 50 states, which is an awfully round number. It's hard to be 49 or 51. Uh, and we just have this, this concept of manifest destiny, you know, westward expansion. It's, so, so, but the idea that, that we have to serve political arrangements rather than political arrangements serving us is so crazy. It's so harmful. And it's such a recipe for hatred. I, I mean... <laughs> I mean, let's see. Let, that, okay, so this this might be jumping ahead, but to, to the critical difference in, in the way that you and I look at this, because our analysis is almost identical, right? Uh, in in terms of like we both love and hate the same things about this, and it's maybe just I have I have more of a positive outlook, Jeff, and I'm I'm like I'm maybe I'm more optimistic, and I'm seeing like, look, we we live in a in, in a country dominated by socialists, right? And I don't mean Antifa. I mean the mainstream paradigm of government, I think you would agree, by any honest definition, is socialist, right? And so if some of the socialists stop saying, hey, we're going to feed into this big centralized system known as the American federal government, we're going to have our local socialized system and break off and be independent, I, I'm not going to go, but you're still socialist, but you're still, but you didn't do it perfectly. I'm going, that's awesome. And I want to praise them for that. And I want to encourage that good activity. I want to encourage that good behavior. And I want to encourage activism that shifts us away from exactly the problem that you pointed out just now of this mentality of, of, of the whole country of being forced collectivism. So, I mean, is, is that it? Well, I look, my my friend Marcus Ruiz runs an organization called Yes California, which is all about breaking that uh, state away from the rest of the union. And he's a you know a great guy, mostly a left left progressive. He actually argues that California pensions and everything would be improved if California wasn't sending money to D.C. and was just keeping it in its own state tax system. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, you know, there'd be 30 or 40 percent of Californians who live there now who would who would probably feel worse off and harmed. But, you know, it, it's easier for them to move to Arizona or Nevada or something like that than to, you know, move farther. And I, I mean, when it comes to activism, we have our, we have in front of us, I think, the perfect model to really enact this, 
without hurting anyone on either side. And that's Indian reservations. I mean, we've, we've talked a, a big game about tribal sovereignty for a long time. Let's do it. I mean, let's give them real sovereignty. Let's create nations within a nation where, these, where, where Indians can say, look, you know, this is, this is sovereign land. It is a foreign country. And some of them would obviously need port access and, and that sort of thing as well. So they wouldn't all be landlocked. But, but so these are sovereign countries. They issue passports. There's no BLM, no FBI, no ATF, no IRS. Um, you know, it, to, to smooth things over at the outset, we say, of course, you can maintain your U.S. citizenship for travel and, and whatever if you care to. You can come and go as you care to. Uh, but but within the the reservation itself, that's a foreign country. You can you can sell the land if you want money. You can have tourism. You can have casinos. You can have whatever that you want. I mean, so who would object to this? Because we all say we all say we believe in tribal sovereignty. So let's try that. Let, let's let them have a different system. Okay, so I got two more specific questions about Chaz, one more general, and then we're going to take comments uh, from the audience and questions for Jeff about this subject. Uh, first, I mean, you made this case for the people in California, uh, you can just move to the next state. Well, that sounds a lot harder than for someone in an apartment building in the Chaz to move over to the next apartment building and still be in Seattle. Would you make the same case there? Well, I think that's what they should do. We're going to we're going to see how long this goes on. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I think uh, smaller, more decentralized polities are preferable. Uh, so, yeah, it's easier to move within Seattle than to leave the state of Washington. Absolutely. I would agree with that. OK, so then the uh, shooting that happened this past weekend, I'm, I'm actually I think it's a, a testament to your intellectual integrity. That in, in, in all of the this, in one of the things I really appreciated about your article is that it it didn't engage in the typical intellectual fallacies that we see people using to discredit this. And again, I was just I was excited that we had a, a libertarian heavyweight like yourself giving this honest intellectual consideration rather than oh, it's a bunch of communist protesters making a protest zone. You know, forget about them. So the shooting and, and some of the other things that people have cherry picked and be like, oh, well, there was a rape there or, oh, well, there was somebody got something stolen. From, there was a crazy person ranting in the street. That's Chaz for it. What, what do, you, do you make anything of, of these points that are being used sometimes honestly and sometimes with intellectual dishonesty to discredit Chaz? I guess we have to call it chop well, now. Let's be politically correct chop. and use the right pronouns and acronyms for these for these uh, these these SJWs, uh, there are a bunch of people murdered in Chicago over the weekend. The last time I checked, Chicago was still under federal jurisdiction, still had Chicago PD. Uh, you, you know, I mean, look, the the goal here is better, not perfect. And and to me, anyway, better the the more self determination an area exercises, the better. So, um, you know, I I don't think that this is I don't think we ought to judge it by the fact that some bad things happen there, I, you know, do Americans really think that there haven't always been communists in America, for example? So if we say, oh, it's a bunch of left wing commies, well, there are always commies in America. They're they're spread out all over. A lot of them are teaching at your kid's school. So I, I don't understand this. Wouldn't you prefer to isolate them? Yes, yes. Oh, I, 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 I tried to make fun of Trump with this with a right? tweet. I mean, Trump says I mean, we have to save America from the crazy terrorist, socialist, communist, Antifa people, and then also Trump. We have to prevent them from leaving America. Right. Like, well, well let them right. go. Let them go. Let them have their experiment, right? Let them isolate. It is mad to hear, to hear conservatives complain that communists and socialists have separated and want their own little system and are going to stop bothering the, the rest of us. Like, uh, the, 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 the contradictions of nationalism, right? Well, I guess in some fantasy, they imagine that they're going to win people over. And, you know, honestly, separating is is at this point a lot more practical and realistic than persuasion. There's there's a lot of people in this country, in this world who are really wired, 
hardwired, maybe, I don't know, in, in a manner that, that we would call collectivist. And mm -hmm. I, I don't want to vanquish them. I don't want to defeat right. them militarily or politically, which are really close cousins, by the way. Um, Mises has this great quote where he says, um, I'm paraphrasing him here. He says, if you live in a country under political arrangement with, you know, with which you disagree, it, it barely matters whether that was because of a military invasion or an election. Mm -hmm. Now that, that might seem uh, histrionic, but this, this guy was a, a veteran of uh, artillery battles in World War I. So he's not someone who used war metaphors or analogies in a breezy way. He was a serious guy who saw some ugly things. So uh, there's a lot of Hillary voters in this country right now who feel like they're in some sort of occupied territory. Yeah. I, maybe that's silly. I don't know, but but that's that's legitimately how they feel. So yeah. what, what? But when when you get together, especially with progressives, I gotta say, I think progressives are worse on this. When you say, okay, in the face of all this evidence, all this hostility, all this bad will, let's break up. All of a sudden, I get you get what I think is sort of a white savior complex. Well, no, 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 we can't do that because there'd still be our people in those horrible red states. You know, oh my God, Alabama would be there. There's a there's a bunch of people in Alabama who need to be saved by progressives like me, and they'd be forced to live with all these all these uh, Trump uh, secessionists or something like that. So I think that's, that's sort of the mentality that that's involved because you do, you get a lot of resistance on this even now, even when you read the papers and see all this, this, uh, you know, I look, I think the media exaggerates things. I think that the actual divisions on a personal one-to-one -one level between, uh, let's say someone like me and some avocado toast, uh, you know, Antifa skinny white dude in, in, in Seattle, it's not really that great, but you know our political arrangement intensifies it. Whatever, whatever differences right. we have, DC is weaponizing it yes. and making that guy hate me, and vice versa. Yes, because you are forced to fight over policy in a centralized system, as opposed to respecting each other's or having a system that respects your differences and ability to organize well, in communities with different policy. I mean. Why should some avocado toast guy in Seattle have to worry about who the next Alabama senator is going to be? Well, hey, Jess, you got you to be careful with the food, man. You can be a libertarian and love avocado toast. Just saying, no, no, I no, have you need evidence. To, of, you I have, have evidence avocado of steak, no toast. <laughs> Can't bread is death. All right. So I, I, I just want to underscore one point that you made there that, that's so critical which is why I've always been about localization as the way to move forward. And especially with Black Lives Matter and all the issues that they're raising, for a lot of people, they feel like they're in an occupied country. And when you have police terrorizing your community, literally using fear to manipulate your community, it could be worse, and historically speaking, is worse than some actual military occupations. So. That being said, it's clear, it's easier to convince people not to force their ideologies on others than to get them to change their ideologies. And to us, this does represent in a change in ideology because a libertarian says, well, hey, if you believe whatever you want, you can be as liberal or as conservative as you want. You can have whatever preferences for the aesthetics of the community that you live in it can look and be organized however you want as long as it's done ethically by libertarian ethical principles and you're not violating the non-aggression principle you're not forcing your system on anybody else so jeff before we go to our audience for a few questions here to wrap things up things up i have i have one bigger question that that i've just i've been kind of dying to ask you as, as a matter of messaging because oftentimes libertarians are painted as uncaring or insensitive and we say we don't want the government to do these things by violence we want peaceful solutions people don't hear past the first part of we don't want government to do these things and assume we don't want these things done and there's one opportunity that i believe we are seriously missing out on as a way of connecting with people 
of a more leftist mentality with libertarian ethics. And it's about the property that's been stolen. And we don't seem to address this enough as libertarians, right? When we say taxation is theft. Okay, well, what do you do when something is stolen from you? How do you achieve justice? You get it back to its rightful owner. And a lot of liberals who are concerned with wealth and equality in the world don't get good answers from libertarians. And I, I, I think I give a good answer because I like to say, yes, those concentrations of wealth and power that exist in the world today only exist because of government. And we should look towards political solutions to take back that which has been stolen from the people. Libertarians are against redistribution of wealth unless it's being redistributed from a thief back to its victims. Is there, so my question is, Jeff, is this something that libertarians can and should talk about more? And is there a better way we can show that property rights and self-ownership addresses these problems of wealth and equality raised by the left? Well, whether we want to talk about it or not, I think we're going to have to. I, I think reparations are going to be a real issue. Um, reparations for blacks. Uh, probably between Biden and Trump, I don't know, but it's, it's certainly down the road. Um, and it's very, very difficult to give people pat answers. I'm for reparations or against, because in any sort of libertarian conception, there has to be a level of specificity. You have to be able to go back and trace a claim and preferably trace a victim rather than just have, you know, the federal government effectively sort of print up a bunch of money and give it to black folks only. So, you know, we don't believe in generalized or social justice. We believe in specific individual justice. So that's that's the fly in the ointment because we've always got a butt. Uh, you know, that said- so, so then to the policy question, how would you policy-wise want to see this giant knot untangled of all of the unjustified existing concentrations of wealth and power in the world that have largely been stolen through government? Well, I, first and foremost, you have to get rid of the Fed. In, in, until you're serious about private money, there's always going to be huge inequality driven by people who are closest to the source. And so the, the problem is, is when the left makes the critique of the rich that they're undeserving, there is some truth to that. That's the problem. There's some truth to that. There, there really is a class of undeserving rich people in America. Now, whether they'd still be rich, but just not as rich is a separate question. But I mean, the problem is that's true. The left just doesn't understand how and why. Um, so I, I think you got to start there. But when it comes to any kind of reparations, any kind of property, income tax, anything like that, to me, the, 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 the go-to answer is federal land. The federal government yep. owns so much land in this country, something like 80% of the state of Nevada. I mean, just vast tracts in Canada. 50% of land west of the Mississippi. In Canada, it's 90%. So wow. you got to start there. I, you know, it just as a practical or pragmatic matter, if you're going to sell it, people get very nervous if you start thinking, well, you're going to be taxed to pay reparations to somebody else, for example. Right. Uh, right. So I, no, you so, know, so fed, I, federal land, I, I mean, America's empty. America's wide open. Uh, America is is not full. America's got plenty of land. And so, w w you know, to, to, make, to, to make the left understand, you gotta give them ownership. You know, this looting and destroying mentality, you, you only see that amongst people who, who feel like they have nothing that they own. I mean, an, an ownership society, is a society which the Republicans used to talk about. They don't talk about it anymore. But the idea of an ownership society, I think property is, is at the core of libertarianism. And when people have property, when they own stuff, they have skin in the game. It's very important. Okay, I'm I'm 100% with you and the Fed and the theft and the illegitimate land property claims of government. But I, I do want to put you on the spot here, Jeff, policy-wise. I mean, I have my answer through localization. When I say, you know, when people say four reparations, I would say only to all victims of government as government dissolves is into every single American. And, and, and you know, in, in our presidential campaign, we have a way of localization that uh, accomplishes that. And so policy wise, though, and, and, and you feel free to say, I don't know here, but is, is there a way that you have in mind that you would like to see 
this wealth return to the people? Well, I think in specific cases where it's really traceable, I think the court system should give uh, right, certain, right, no, native, I mean, certain Native Americans, sense. certain African Americans reparations, I suppose. No, 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 no. I mean, in the general sense, the federal government has all this money, right? The federal okay. government has all this property. These corporations, which are government created quasi monopolies, right? All, corporate oligopolies have wealth and, and just actual material wealth and dollars in the bank. What should happen to it? We can, we can, like, cause here's, here's the thing. We can clearly say, here's money that's been stolen. And we can clearly say, here's who it's been stolen from, the American taxpayer. The in between, the, the big knot of government rearranging and confusing and muddling things up is where it gets difficult. And obviously, there's no perfect, clear path by libertarian justice that says, well, we're going to take everything that's been stolen and give it exactly back to its rightful owners. Is there any real policy that you've heard that you like as a way to fix that? Uh, it's I mean, it's tough. I in, in a sense, I don't know, because the you know, other than the court system itself, when you've got stuff that's 100 years old, you know, you may have. An, uh, an unholy arrangement with a corporation that has its roots 100, 150 years ago, where they started to amass property and then things piggyback on that. Uh, you could say the same thing about land. You know, you may go buy a condo in 2020 and, you know, it's had that, that la property's had several owners over the decades. So you're a bona fide purchaser. I mean, you're, 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 you know, operating in goodwill. But 100 years ago, that underlying piece of property had an unholy, a zoning or land deal or something with some town, you know, that city had a cronyist arrangement with a mayor and a private property developer. You know, how, how do you undo that today without just making the whole country so unstable because nobody has any certainty or clarity, clarity over property rights? I mean, I don't, I don't know. It's it's really tough. And, and you know, Mises said that if if you just wait a couple of if you have a free market system going forward, that stuff will work itself out over a couple of generations because, you know, more competent people will tend to to ha have more property. But that's a pretty unsatisfying answer to people today. So do I want to up? do I want to have a big upheaval over every property title in the United States today in courts because of what happened 100 years ago, 200 years ago? I guess that's I guess I'd have to say no. Yeah, that's not the way to do it. Yeah, so I mean, my inclination, and, and this is you know what I've tried to manifest in policy it, proposals, is if we can clearly identify this has been stolen, but we can't clearly identify where it came from, the people who have stolen it should give it up as practically best they can, as efficiently, as easily, to as many people as can be identified who have been stolen from. So that's why what I would support is dissolution of government through localization layer by layer, where in every layer it just goes, okay, we're giving everything back to the citizens. It's not perfect, but as much as possible, here it all goes to individuals. All right, so with that being said, we go to our comment section. Jim Freedom, do we okay. have any questions for Mr. Dice today? We do. We do have questions, uh, a couple of them. First, I just wanted to say I absolutely enjoyed that discussion. You guys are both amazing individuals, and I loved every minute of it. So thank you very much. Uh, moving on, Draco Chainmail is asking, Jeff, wouldn't making all these new countries complicate things more than necessary? Wouldn't it be easier to call them a new state within the union? Well, maybe. I mean, there's a great example in Switzerland. We, we have this problem in the United States where 80 percent of our governance is federal and maybe 20 of it's state and local. You know, we, we could flip that even without a, a truly radical uh, uh, situation where cer certain states literally secede. You know, maybe maybe as a practical matter, as a as a movement towards uh, a greater degree of, of freedom. We say, look, Jeff, it's just not realistic right now. But but here, because of federal land, because of the U.S. military, because of the U.S. control of the dollar, because of um, Social Security, and Medicare entitlements that people are relying on, you know, this all of this has to remain sort of in a federal system. But what if instead of sending 80 percent of your taxes to the feds and 20 to your state, what if that were flipped, which it absolutely is in in Switzerland? 
What if we started viewing states or breakaway uh, regions within those states as really autonomous cantons where, where most of the decision making was made locally? I mean, I, I think there are transitional ways here. And look, you know, there are difficulties. This is not going to be easy. There's always going to be the people who object. There's always going to be people who feel worse off. But but what are we facing otherwise? We're facing people, and I'm not talking about just people like us. I'm talking about mainstream conservatives and liberals are, are more and more talking about the possibility of an open, hot civil war. Okay. All, all kinds of economists of all stripes are talking about the debt and the deficits and, and entitlements as just being absolute catastrophes in the not so distant future. So, you know, it, it's like we've got a tidal wave coming at us and we're si we're going like, well, if we uh, start paddling in a different direction, uh, that's that's going to that's going to be difficult. Oh, it might be difficult. You're right. So I, I would agree on the general point of low anything towards localization is good. And, and, and Jeff makes a really powerful point there about that, you know, just flipping local orientation versus federal on its head. But I would I would then say, well, would you would you tell the founders of this country, you know, you should just ask for a little more colonial autonomy. You know, would, would you would you really tell someone like if, if, if your if your spouse is beating you, would you say, well, you know, you can still beat me as long as you beat me less. You know, and it's like, yeah, of course, being beat less is better. But I think there's, you know, and, and I would support, I think as Jeff implied there, you know, anything that moves us in that direction of more local control. But when, when you say, why not just become a separate state? Okay, look, there are times when that's appropriate, but if you're capable of making things better by drawing a, a hard line of, of sovereignty and asserting your, your moral rights, I think that's something that should be pursued when possible. Don't mean to answer every question for Jeff here or to differentiate myself on everyone. I know we don't have a lot of time. Let's get some more questions from the chat, please, Jim. Okay, uh, one more question from Psychic Taxi on YouTube. Jeff, do you personally know any Ron Paul supporters that did not vote for Donald Trump other than hardcore LPers or office holders? Yes. <laughs> Uh oh, <laughs> that's a pretty easy oh, one. Yeah, yeah. No, Jeff, give us give us a little more on this because this is something uh, you know. In my debate with the communists the other day, he was like, "Adam, everybody's abandoned you to become Trump supporters," and I'm like, "What are you talking about? Can, well, what can you say to counter this narrative, Jeff?" Well, I think some people are Trump supporters because we've gotten into a really ugly us versus them in this country, really ugly. To the point where it's like them means people who want me dead. So therefore I have to be us. Yeah. Um, and, and you've got that on both sides. But I, look, I've always said, I think libertarians really never understood Trump. It was never about him. It was never about his policies. It was never about his cabinet. It was, it was about, he basically won as a third party candidate. And, and that's, that's what people don't get about Trump. He, he had no ground game. He, he spent half of what Hillary spent. He was on the ballot. That's the GOP got him ballot access. That's basically what he got. I mean, he was he was opposed tooth and nail. I mean, he he basically was Ross Perot on steroids. And and to to be so dismissive of that, I think, is really, really shows um, it, it was just a bad idea that, that I mean, 60 odd million people were willing to go off the reservation and not vote for Hillary and vote for this real estate uh, reality show guy. And, and, you know, and to, that, to be dismissive of that was to be dismissive of a, a real sea change and an opportunity from my perspective. And so, you know, I, um, did, I, I'm sure a lot of Ron Paul people went for Bernie, a lot of them went for Trump, I don't know. Uh, they didn't go for Rand, they didn't go for Gary Johnson. I mean, this idea that there is a libertarian wing let's say within the GOP, I, I don't really think there is in the Democratic Party, but there's a libertarian wing within the GOP. Well, they had chances. They had two chances to vote for Ron. They had a chance to vote for Rand. You, you know, I mean, they were, these were 2% type figures in New Hampshire and Iowa, there was some fraud, but, um, you know, people, people really re revert to their safe spaces, no matter what they say. Um, 
So so Trump Trump was a revolution. I mean that that he beat Hillary. I mean people still don't get what that meant. I would save the word revolution for other uses, Jeff, but your your point is very well. Well not taken. not ideological. He was a political revolution. <laughs> Yeah. And, well, I, I hope uh, in that sense, it's like it's a regressive. Uh, it's a regressive turn to personality driven politics. But I, I suppose that's that's uh, progress from mindless partisan voting. So that being said, Jeff, I, I man, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, I really appreciate this kind of conversation. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that, you know, out of this, people can see the good and the possibilities that are inspired by Chaz slash Chop and and what the silly communists and socialists are doing when they do something right and powerful that we can all learn from, if not imitate in our own way. So that being said, Jeff, uh, any closing thoughts, anything else you want to say to to wrap this up or plug uh, anything other than, of course, Mises.org, which is the website I got to give credit for a big part of my conversion because that was where I downloaded the audiobook for Ethics of Liberty by Murray Rothbard, Changed My Life. Jeff, take us home, brother. Well, the only thing I would ask is, is uh, you know, maybe we should both give an estimate of how long Chaz will exist. Will it be like uh, <laughs> Occupy Wall Street in Zuccotti Park? Now, if I recall, yes. Zuccotti Park was actually private. Uh, so it was a little different situation. People were, you know, that that lasted a long time. I mean, will will Chaz uh, still be there, still blocked off? Uh, no, no car traffic in its basically intact form as it is today uh, as of Labor Day. I'm going to say yes. Yeah, I would I would say the best analogy here in recent history is the Occupy Wall Street movement and uh, a few months, uh, but it also might be, it, it might last indefinitely. Uh, knowing the quirkiness of Seattle and the liberal community there, I wouldn't be surprised if they were able to, and, and there, I saw one proposal, they were, they were gonna downsize it just to a part of the park and a street or something. And if they're able to do that and create like a protest free or a, a police free protest zone of some kind, um, yeah, I think that might actually last in, indefinitely as, as part of the city of Seattle. It's definitely going to last, you know, like, you know, at least, uh, you know, a month or two. It's kind of got that momentum. But I, my only timing prediction would be to say it'll last at least that long. And if it goes longer than that, it'll probably turn into something uh, sort of sustainable, if, if smaller. Good question. We shall see. All right. Any, any final thoughts, sir? No, uh, just please follow me at Jeff Deist on Twitter and uh, All right. look forward to talking to you again.